So you've seen so far in these modules, or yeah, the modules for this course, that constructing antiderivatives is kind of an important thing. It's kind of a, what this course is going to be about. You've seen in the videos that as we seek to accumulate those areas under the curve, as we seek to sum up the areas of infinitely many infinitesimally thin rectangles, that there's this connection between a rate of change function and the function that produced that rate of change. We call it the antiderivative. So that's going to become an important part of this course is, is understanding that relationship between a function and its rate of change, but the other way around, a rate of change and its function. So we're going to take a moment here to just kind of look at the rudimentary elements of constructing antiderivatives. And I like that phrase, construction. It's if you think about how your first semester calculus went, you learned power rule, product rule, quotient rule, chain rule. You learned all the differentiation rules for trigonometric functions or logarithmic functions or exponential functions. So you just applied the rule to get the derivative. Now you're going to see the derivative and have to construct the function that produced that derivative. And that's the mentality I'd like you to have is this idea of construction, constructing antiderivatives. So as you've seen, it all is based on this fundamental theorem of calculus that there is a function times the dx, the height of those rectangles f of x times the little change in x, that dx. And we want to sum up. So the S-shaped integral symbol there is to remind us that we're summing up those areas between or on an interval. And to do so, we're going to need to construct that antiderivative function. So remember, it's the derivative of big F produces little f. This is a rate of change. This is the function that produced that rate of change. And then here's the notation for it. Once we find that function, we're going to evaluate that function at B. That's what this says. Subtract, evaluate the function at A, the fundamental theorem of calculus you've seen previously. So we're going to focus now just on finding that function. How do we think to find that function? Now, on the one hand, you can just kind of follow some steps. And sometimes we do a little bit. But I want to start this off by having you think about the structure, the mathematical structure of functions that we've seen in our calculus experiences. In fact, the just in time before you got into this was about the chain rule, to remind you of the chain rule. So remember the chain rule. Keep that in your mind. Think about structure. We're going to construct antiderivatives just in a few examples here. So the situation is this. Suppose we have the function sine of 2x. I want you to construct capital F of x. Now, the way it might look is you use, as you were constructing this process, it might have happened in kind of bits. Now, this is under construction as I work through this, you guys. This is not like I'm going to write the answer in one fell swoop. Instead, I'm going to construct one thought at a time. Here's my first thought. If the rate of change, if the derivative was the sine function, then the antiderivative has to involve cosine. Now, cosine of what? Well, wait, before I even do that, wait a minute. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Notice there's not a negative here. So it might lead me to think that the derivative of negative cosine would be positive sine. Because eliminate that for a moment. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. By a, multiplying by a negative 1, you would get positive 1. Thus, the derivative of negative cosine would be positive sine. But cosine of what? Well, that chain rule. That's why I hope you watch those chain rule videos first. The chain rule would say the derivative of negative cosine of 2x is the sine of 2x. Now that's great, but the chain rule also says you've got to take the derivative of 2x, which would be 2. Now if there was a 2 right here, then that would make sense. The derivative of negative cosine of 2x is positive sine of 2x. 
the derivative of 2x is 2, and then the 2's there, great. But the 2's not there. So we have to construct a coefficient that would eliminate that 2, the 1 half. So I'm just thinking about derivatives, my experience with Calc 1, and I'm going to construct a function here in big uh, bold symbols here. I'm going to construct a function whose derivative is sine of 2x. Now, can you imagine this? This function, the derivative of this function certainly is the sine of 2x, but can you imagine if it had this function plus 7? Can you imagine taking the function negative 1 half cosine of 2x and adding 7, which would just shift the function 7 units up? That doesn't impact the slope, the rate of change of that function. All it does is take the function and shift it up, translate it up 7 units. So the derivative of negative 1 half cosine of 2x plus 7 would also be sine of 2x. Or what if it was minus 11? The derivative of negative 1 half cosine of 2x minus 11 would be the sine of 2x, just translating down 11 units. So there is not just the one single result here, but in fact there's going to be what we say is a family of antiderivatives. Because we don't know in a naked context like this, we don't have any indication that our antiderivative function has to have some certain element, like it has to contain the point, whatever. And so what we do is we say plus c. And the plus c just is indicating that the derivative of any one of those functions of the form negative a half cosine of 2x plus c is the sine of 2x. So let's try another one. What if the function was x times the quantity x squared plus 3 raised to the fifth power? Your job is to construct, build, little by little, the antiderivative function. Now, again, think structure, think chain rule. Structurally speaking, what I see, first of all, is this stuff, very... Um, unscientific way to say it but this binomial let me say this stuff is being raised to the fifth power if I'm going to construct a function whose derivative has that same stuff to the fifth power then I must have over here that stuff to the sixth power why when you take the derivative we decrease the power by one the power rule so on the antiderivative it would make sense to increase the power by one but notice the construction mentality here. We're not done yet because when you take the derivative, the 6 by the power rule would come out front. It would be 6 times that quantity to the fifth power. There's not a coefficient of 6 out front here. So as we construct the antiderivative, we have to consider that there may be a coefficient that would uh, um, simplify so that the 6 does not show up, or it's a, really a coefficient of 1. Well, 1 -sixth would, oops, a 1 -sixth would do that. Ignore that 1 half. So the 6 out front gets multiplied by the 1 -sixth, producing a 1x, as we see over here. So that's the first thing. Now, I'm not done. I'm still constructing. But what I want you to see is this binomial, this stuff to the fifth power, leads us to think that we need that stuff to the sixth power. The chain rule would say 6 out front times 1 sixth making 1, decrease the power by 1, that's why it's a 5, but the chain rule. The chain rule then would indicate that we would take the derivative of this binomial. And the derivative of this binomial would be just 2x. Ah, that's why there's an x there. That x is there because of the chain rule. The derivative of that stuff, x squared plus 3, is 2x. But the 2 coefficient is not present. So there must have been a multiplier of 1 half in my antiderivative. So that when I took the derivative of that binomial using the chain rule, I would not get 2x, but just x. The 2 and the 1 half making 1 when they multiply. So that's the construction process. I see the structure. I see evidence that the chain rule was applied. 
And so I'm just going to kind of undo the chain rule to get to this result here. And then likewise, because of the horizontal translation, we could, could have had a plus 7, a minus 11, a who knows what constant plus C. Hey, by the way, when I say plus or minus, it could be plus a negative 11, which is equivalent to subtracting 11. It could be plus a positive 7, which would be like a shift up. So we just kind of collapse all that into just a plus C. Now, yes, we can and probably should, just to, for simplification's sake, say 1 6 times 1 half is 1 twelfth. And in this case, we would say that the antiderivative, if we were seeking the area under the th underneath this curve, if we were accumulating the areas of those rectangles, we would use this antiderivative function in that fundamental theorem to actually do that. Okay, just one more for this video. I have three terms. We can, just like with derivatives, we can uh, treat each term independently. Likewise, with antiderivatives, we can treat each term independently. So what I'm going to think this time is, what's the antiderivative of 1 over x squared? What's the antiderivative of the square root of x? What's the antiderivative of 1 over x? But first, you're going to hear me say this in these videos a lot. 10 seconds of algebra. Before you start any anti-differentiation construction, do 10 seconds of algebra. For example, isn't 1 over x squared equivalent to x to the minus 2? Isn't the square root of x equivalent to x to the 1 half power? And I'm going to leave 1 over x, 1 over x, you'll see why, I hope. Now the reason I do this is because then I just have x to a power, and in the case of x to a power, I can apply the power rule. Well, I will anti-differentiate, I will construct the antiderivative using the power rule it would look something like this. Let's start with that x to the minus 2. Now, if the derivative ended up with x to the minus 2, then the antiderivative has to have an x to the minus 1. Remember, you decrease the power by 1. But when you take the derivative, the negative 1 would come out front. So it should have been a negative x to the minus 2. But it's not. It's positive. So we have to construct a way to make that make sense, a negative out front. Negative times negative is positive, x to the decrease by 1. Likewise, antiderivative of x to the 1 half. Well, if the derivative produced a power of 1 half, the antiderivative has to be a 3 halves. Instead of decreasing by 1, we will now increase by 1. But likewise, um, with that power rule, the 3 halves coming out front, you don't see a 3 halves coefficient. So we have to construct a way to eliminate that 3 halves coefficient. A 2 thirds would do that. 3 halves times 2 thirds is 1. And then finally, what about the 1 over x? Now you may have to do some review on this, but it's true that the derivative of the natural log of x was 1 over x. And so the antiderivative of 1 over x must be the natural log of x. So you have to kind of keep this in your mind. We're constructing an antiderivative. The derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. Therefore, the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of x. Don't forget plus c. <laughs> so we're going to just, there's a bazillion different ways these things can happen. I can't show them all to you, but I hope you have now a way of thinking, a mentality as you approach this, of constructing antiderivative functions, looking for structure, watching for that chain rule to kind of unwind in the anti-differentiation process, and then expressing your result as you see on these screens.